Okay, me again. Um, thanks everyone um, to be there, either physically or virtually. So, um, it's my great pleasure to now introduce Stephanie Jones and thank her for um, accepting to give a talk at this conference. Stephanie Jones is an associate professor at Brown University and she performed a PhD in mathematics at Boston uh, with Nancy Koppel, where she developed models of cortical oscillations. And amongst other things, um, Stephanie Jones is specialized in developing uh, biophysically principled models to understand the underlying cellular and uh, network level dynamics of um, electrophysiological recordings. And today she will present uh, one of such uh, toolbox that she developed. It's called the Human Neocortical Neurosolver. And it's a new user-friendly neural modeling tool that she and her team have developed to help researchers and clinicians, so us, to interpret our human neuroimaging data, such as surface EEG and EMG. So the floor is yours, and thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? There seems to be a little delay on my end, so I'm just gonna go ahead and move forward. So thank you again for that introduction and thank you to Alex and the organizers for inviting me to be part of this very exciting symposium. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to be here virtually with you all. And I appreciate your coming for this last talk of the day before. What I understand is a pretty exciting social event. So. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about our software tool, Human Neocortical Neurosolver, or HNN as we call it for short, and how it can be used to interpret the mechanisms and meaning of some of the most commonly measured human EEG and MEG signals. So I'd like to begin by describing the challenge in human neuroscience that we aim to address with this, the, the development of this tool. So we all know EEG and MEG are really powerful technologies to study human brain dynamics non-invasively with millisecond resolution. But there's a downside in that what we're recording is the so-called macro scale activity that's generated by large ensembles of neurons. And it's still difficult to infer how these signals are generated by the underlying cells in circuits. And this circuit level dynamic understanding is really critical if we wanna know why these signals correlate with information processing or if we want to develop treatments to target them when they're disrupted, disrupted in pathology. So intracranial recording techniques and neuromodula neuromodulation techniques in animals such as mice and monkeys are obviously ideal for dissecting circuit level activity, but there's still lots of challenges in doing this in the human. And so what we need is a translator that can connect this rich information we can get in animal models to these powerful data streams that we can obtain in humans. And this is the perfect job for computational neural modeling where we can simulate the activity of the neurons and we can have specificity both at this micro circuit level and at this macro scale recording level. And this has been the primary focus of my lab. Um, and we've been developing this modeling framework over many years. And we've recently turned it into a software human neocortical neurosolver that we've designed for the community to begin to develop and test predictions on the neural origin of your human MEG and EEG data. And so in my talk today, I'm gonna to start by giving you some of the background on the computational framework used in the development of HNN. And then I'm gonna go through an application of HNN based on studies in my lab aimed at uncovering the circuit mechanisms involved in tactile perception. I'll describe how we've used HNN to study mechanisms underlying somatosensory evoked potentials, and also the influence of brain rhythms on correlates of perception in these evoked signals. And lastly, I'll end by describing some other applications. So how do we begin to develop a framework to connect these extracranial signals to the underlying neural dynamics? Well, any model of neural dynamics at the end of the day is a system of differential equations that describes how the electrical activity created by neurons changes over time. And I promise you, this is the only equation that I'm gonna to show today. Um, but the, the challenge in human neuroscience, in computational neuroscience is really deciding what's the right scale of the model to develop 
to answer the question that we're interested in. And so for modeling human EEG and MEG, there's lots of different scales of modeling with different levels of complexity that we can develop. And so I'm gonna briefly describe to you some of the different levels of modeling that we apply, and then why we chose the level that we did in our HNN software. So at the top of the pyramid here are models with minimal levels of complexity. And one example of that is neural mass models or population models, where a small number of variables is used to represent the state in an entire population of neurons. This is the type of modeling that's often used in dynamic causal modeling, where one assumes a number of active nodes in the brains and infers connectivity between them using Bayesian statistics. From there, we can increase the level of complexity and we can simulate the spiking activity of all the individual neurons in the brain. Typically, we do this in reduced form. We call these point neurons where we collapse the morphology down to a single point. You can simulate the spiking activity with various levels of complexity. You could use things like integrate and fire neurons or Itchovkavitz neurons, Hodgkin-Huxley neurons, for any of you that are familiar with some of these terms. Now, we also know that EEG and MEG primarily reflect activity in the cortical surface. And so we can begin to include some of the anatomy and physiology of the laminated structure and the connectivity in between the neurons. Now, because it's a model, we can build in as much detail as we want. We can include all of the anatomy and physiology of all the neurons in the laminar structure. And obviously, the more complex the model is, the more computationally expensive it is, the harder it is to develop, and the harder it is to understand at the end of the day. And so again, our challenge in neural modeling is deciding, well, what's the right level of detail for the question that we're interested in? And all of the levels of detail are important, but for the question that we're interested in, which is what is the underlying cell and circuit level activity of these human MEG and EEG signals, we've decided that the right level of detail should include at least some of the anatomy and physiology of the laminated structure of the cortex. And to understand why that's the level we think is important, we need to go back and think about what we're recording. So when we record extracranially with EEG or MEG, the first thing that we do is we apply inverse solution methods, and these allow us to estimate the location the direction and the time course of these big electrical currents in the brain that are, record, that are generating our sensor level data. These are known as primary currents. From there, we need to connect the primary currents to their biophysical origin. And these primary currents are known to be generated by the postsynaptic intracellular current flow and these long and spatially extended cortical pyramidal neuron dendrites. Essentially, the orientation and alignment of these long dendrites in the cortex creates a large electrical current that we can record outside of the head with either MEG or EEG. And so knowing that this is where the signal comes from, there are some key canonical features of cortical circuitry to include in the model to connect it to the cell and circuit level detail. The first is that the cortex is a layered structure. We have excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the supergranular and infragranular layers that are synaptically coupled with excitatory and inhibitory synapses. Importantly, these cortical networks don't sit in isolation, but they're constantly receiving input from other parts of the brain. There are two primary pathways of information flow to the cortex. One is a pathway that comes from the lemniscal thalamus. This is the pathway that relays sensory information into the brain, up to the thalamus, and then into the cortex, where it effectively propagates to the proximal dendrites of these pyramidal neurons, and we often refer to it as proximal drive. The other pathway of information comes right into the supergranular layers. This is the information that comes from higher order, higher order cortical areas, or from these non-lemniscal thalamic nuclei that we know project right up to the supergranular layers. And each of these input pathways forms excitatory synapses on the excitatory inhibitory cells in the local network. Now with this construction, the primary current dipole signal, as I've mentioned, comes from the net intracellular current flow summed up over the entire population of pyramidal neurons. And if you have this level of detail in the model, the units that come out are current times distance, or nanoampere meter. That's the same unit of measure that we can get from our source localized signal 
And so we have one-to-one -one correspondence between the output of our model and our source localized data. And this turns out to be a really powerful framework to begin to develop and test predictions on where these macro scale signals may be coming from. And so the schematic that I'm showing you here is obviously a reduced representation of the full complexity of the neurons in the neural circuits, because we believe at the macro scale, we don't have access to all of the finer details, but we can nonetheless infer something about these key canonical features from our signal. And so my group has been building such reduced models. And I'm gonna next give you a little bit more detail about what goes into the development of this model. And so the pyramidal neurons we have in our model, they're simulated with multiple compartments. The inhibitory neurons, which don't contribute directly to the recorded signal, but nonetheless, they're important for the dynamics that come out of this network. They're modeled with single compartment, these point neurons that I mentioned. We have GABAergic and glutamatergic synapses connecting these neurons. And then we simulate the voltage in each compartment, what's called a Hodgkin-Huxley current balance equation. And we get this intracellular current um, through cable theory. And then to get the primary current dipole, again, we're just summing up the intracellular currents across all the population of pyramidal neurons. Now I've mentioned these input pathways that represent input to this local circuit from either the thalamus or higher order cortical areas. In the model, we're not simulating all of these networks. Instead, what we do is we generate trains of action potentials in predefined patterns that activate this network through either this feed forward proximal drive projection or a feedback distal drive projection. And so essentially what happens is if I simulate a train of action potentials and I have control over what this pattern of activity looks like, this will come in, it will hit excitatory synapses in the network and drive current flow up these pyramidal neuron dendrites to create a positive deflecting signal. If instead I have feedback drive or distal drive, this will come in, excite the distal dendrites and push current flow down the dendrites. And it's a combination of this feed forward and feedback drive in concert with the local network dynamics that create this recorded signal in my EEG or MEG measure. And so this schematic is a reduced representation of the network contained in HNN. The full network has a scalable number of neurons in the supergranular and infragranular layers. It represents a patch of cortex in a localized brain area based on these generalizable features of cortical circuitry. We've been specifically designing this software to study some of the most commonly measured EEG and MEG signals. And we've been focusing on ERPs, event-related potentials, and low frequency brain rhythms in the alpha, beta, and gamma bands. Now, this is a really complicated large-scale network. There's thousands of differential equations. There's even more parameters. Um, and it can be really difficult to work with this type of neuromodeling if you don't have experience in neuromodeling. And even when you do, it can be very challenging. And so what we've done to make this modeling framework accessible to the broad MEG and EEG user community is we've embedded this model in a user-friendly graphical user interface we have a website that contains installation instructions. It now installs on all major platforms. Um, and we provide tutorials with example data sets and parameter sets to begin to teach the community how to study ERPs and brain rhythms. And this all builds from our own prior studies. We give you our data, we give you our parameter sets with the idea that if we can teach you how to study some of these commonly measured signals, then you can begin to adapt the framework to study your own data. We're also developing this software with best practices in open source software design, uh, thanks to Manak Yas, who, Manak Yas, who worked with Alex Graham Fort in the m and &E Python team. Um, and so we now also have a Pythonic interface, which we're calling HNN Core, and you can get that on our GitHub page. Okay, and so next what I wanna do is go through an example of how we use this software to study some common MEG and EEG signals. And I'm gonna go through an example from my lab where we've been studying somatosensory perception. And so we perform tactile detection experiments where we give subjects a brief tap to the middle finger and we ask them, did you feel it or did you not feel it? And then we record the brain activity with either EEG or MEG. 
and we apply inverse solution techniques to isolate the contribution from the hand area of S1. And what I'm showing you here is the evoked response from S1 from a fairly strong tap to the finger where the subject reported feeling it 100% of the time. And we can just load this into our graphical user interface. And so the first study that we did with this model back in 2007 was to try to understand how is this ERP generated in this underlying circuit. And to do that, we first went to the literature. And there's a long history of literature investigating the origin of evoked potentials, and in particular, somatosensory evoked potentials. And what this literature suggests is the following. It suggests that this evoked response is generated by a sequence of activation of this local cortical circuit that consists of a feed forward input, an input that comes in through the thalamus and up to the cortex approximately 25 milliseconds after you tap the finger. Approximately 70 milliseconds after you tap the finger, this signal has gone to another part of the brain and comes back to the local S1 circuit through this feedback pathway. Then there's a thalamocortical loop of activity, and there's a re-emergent feed-forward input approximately 100 milliseconds after you tap the finger at 125 milliseconds. And again, there's lots of literature supporting the idea that this is what's generating this S1 evoked response. And so in HNN, we wanted to test the hypothesis. Can this sequence of activation generate this macro-scale ERP that we've recorded in our data? And so to do that, we can define this sequence of drive. We go into our set parameters button. A dialog box opens that allows you to define different ways to activate this network. So the name of the game in the software is how are you going to activate this network to represent your simulation experiment? And so here you can see you can define different types of input. We have this evoked inputs button where you can press on that and define the inputs. You can actually load the inputs from this study that I'm describing here. It's distributed with our software. And so I'm just going to load that in. And when I do, you can see the histogram at the top of the pattern of drive that's going to activate this network. We have this feed forward drive at approximately 25 milliseconds. Then we have this feedback distal drive at approximately 60 milliseconds. And then this re-emergent feed forward drive. And so when I hit run simulation, these spike trains are going to activate excitatory synapses and drive activity in the network. And then I'm going to read out the net current dipole response. And so I hit run simulation. Oops, sorry, I can't actually hit the button on the screen. And you can see that this pattern of activity can nicely reproduce this recorded S1 ERP. Now, it's important to understand that while the literature guided us as to the hypothesis to test, we spent a lot of time tuning the timing and the strength of these inputs in order to get an accurate representation of this ERP. And we now have some optimization tools in our software to help you optimize the parameters that can match onto your recorded signal um, in our software. And we're working now on some more advanced optimization tools with Alex and his group to apply some simulation-based inference to estimate parameters in the model. So we have this nice representation of this macro scale signal, but our tool is designed to connect to the microcircuit activity. And so we can go in and we can view various details of the underlying microcircuit. And so you can look at different layer specific responses, spiking responses. You can look at the frequency response in the network. And so I'm just gonna show you some examples of the different things that you can view simultaneously with your net current dipole. And so here's our simulated S1 dipole response. We can go in and we can look at the somatic voltage from each cell in the network. We can look at the layer specific responses. We can look at the spiking activity of each and every neuron in the network and then get an understanding how this underlying microcircuit activity contributes to this macro scale current flow that we're recording. So what I've been concentrating on here is um, the data from our group where we're studying tactile perception. But what I want to show you next is that this canonical microcircuitry can also account for evoked responses from other sensory areas. And so what I'm showing you here is an auditory evoked response from the brief presentation of a letter sound and a visual evoked response from a brief flash 
of a checkerboard. Um, and these have been source localized to A1 and V1. And what you'll notice is that while there's clear differences in these signals, all of them start by first going up, then they have this prominent negative deflection, and then they go up again with this positive deflection. And what we've shown in HNN is that this same sequence of information flow, which is feed forward, feed back, feed forward, can be used to reproduce each of these source localized ERPs. And again, we've tuned the timing and the strength of these exogenous proximal and distal drives in order to get an accurate representation. But the consistency and the mechanisms reproducing these are ERPs suggests that at the macro scale observable, they're constrained, <clears throat> excuse me, constrained by commonalities in the canonical structure and input patterns to the neocortex. Okay, so from here, we can use HNN to investigate the neural origin of differences in this ERP across experimental conditions. And in my lab, again, we're studying tactile perception. So we're gonna look at the evoked response on conditions where the subject said they felt the tap to the finger versus trials where they did not feel the tap to the finger. Um, and what I'm gonna to describe to you is how the ongoing pre-stimulus state in S1 before we actually tap the finger impacts the evoked response and the ability to feel that tap. And then I'm gonna describe how we can use HNN to understand why. Okay, so this is again our source localized S1 signal. And here I'm showing you the time domain signal before we tap the finger, um, up to a second before we tap the finger. And what you can see is there's this large amplitude, low frequency oscillation. When we apply a frequency filter, this is just a standard wavelet analysis, what we see is that this oscillation has a very strong component in this 15 to 29 hertz, what we call beta band. But the expression of beta at any moment in time is changing. And the question we were interested in is, does this pre-seamless beta rhythm influence the ability to feel that tap to the finger? And I should mention that we keep the tap to the finger, finger at a perceptual threshold level. And so when asking the question, does this pre rhythm influence the tactile detection ability? The answer to that question is yes. And so here what I'm showing you is we're plotting the pre-stimulus beta power sorted from low power to high power. Here I'm just averaging across the one second pre-stimulus window and I'm averaging across the frequencies band and again, sorting from low to high power. And then I'm plotting the detect detection rate as a percent change in hit rate from the mean. So the higher it is, the more likely the subject is to say, I felt that tap to the finger, the lower it is, the less likely. And you can see very clearly that the more beta power you have, the less likely you are to perceive that tap. And so in this way, we think of beta as inhibiting perception. We've also looked at the influence of this beta rhythm on the filtering of that tactile evoked response. And so here I'll show you when we sort the evoked response, so this is the evoked response from the tap to the finger, over trials where we had low beta power versus trials where we had high beta power, you can see that there's a difference in the evoked response right after you tap the finger, and also the amplitude is different at a, starting at approximately 70 milliseconds. Now, if we instead sort these evoked responses on trials where the subject said, I felt the tap, I detected it, or I didn't feel the tap, we're showing those here in light. And you can see that there's strong similarity between the influence of beta on the evoked response and the influence of detection probability on the evoked response. So this suggests that there's some causal relationship between this pre-stimulus beta oscillation, the evoked response, and the ability to feel that tap to the finger some kind of a causal relationship. And so the ultimate question we were interested in is can HS, HNN help us understand why? Can we use it to understand what are the mechanisms generating these beta rhythms? And why when they're in place and I tap the finger, does it lead to a lower amplitude signal? And why does that correspond to the subject saying, I didn't feel the tap to the finger? And so before we can address this question, we're gonna start by simulating the mechanisms that create these beta rhythms. But before we do, we have to take a closer look at what we're trying to simulate. And what I've been showing you up to this point is average data. 
um, in this trace right here, sorry, I'll just go back. This is the average about 100 trials of the tap to the finger. But when we look at the unaveraged response, what you see is that these spontaneous beta oscillations emerge very transiently. They typically last less than 150 milliseconds. And they have this stereotypical waveform shape. And so here I'm just showing you the raw, unfiltered data. We put our frequency filter on it. We find these high power beta events. We go back to the raw signal and we overlay these traces. And you can see very clearly that there's this stereotypical waveform shape that's defined by this negative deflection that lasts 50 milliseconds. And when we put a frequency filter on a signal that looks like this, we get high power in the beta band. Importantly, this is not a sinusoidal oscillation. And the stereotype nature of this signal suggests that there's some reproducible and reliable mechanism that's generating these beta events. And here I'm just showing you some quantification, um, but I think you can see from the raw signal very clearly that they have this stereotypical shape. Now this transient or event-like nature of beta events has now been shown to be a very robust phenomena. We've observed it um, also in frontal cortex during somatosensory attention tasks. We've observed it in ECOG signals over sen sensory motor cortex. We've also observed similar transient waveforms in intracranial recordings and local field potentials from a both anesthetized mice and awake monkeys. Others have seen similar beta activity in motor cortex in many areas throughout the brain. And so the idea is, can we apply HNN to understand how this waveform shape is generated? And again, if we can understand how beta is generated, then maybe we can understand why it has an inhibitory influence on tactile perception. And so due to time constraints, I'm just gonna give you the punchline of our study. And so through a long history of trial and error, in trying to match the output of this model to that waveform that we're recording in our source localized data, we've come up with the following prediction on where these beta events com come from. And it's suggesting that beta emerges from the simultaneous integration of a broad proximal drive together with a strong distal drive that lasts 50 milliseconds. And so here again, I'm showing you the histogram of the spikes that we're using to activate this local network through these proximal and distal projection patterns. And just to unpack for you how this pattern of input creates this shape, if we only had this proximal input, what that would do is it would come in, it would drive current flow up our pyramidal neuron dendrites. And without that distal drive, we just have one positive deflection um, in our signal. But at the same time, we have this strong distal drive. It comes in and it lasts 50 milliseconds, pushes current flow down the dendrites for this beta period of 50 milliseconds, and that creates our waveform shape. And so, Again, with this mechanism, we were able to reproduce very nicely various quantified features of our MEG data. And because of the level and the detail in the model, we could also go in with invasive recordings and start to test these model-based predictions. Um, and with laminar recordings and current source density in both mice and monkey, we found some initial validation that this mechanism may be occurring to generate these beta events. And more recently, we used laminar resolved MEG with our collaborators um, at UCL that also supported this model drive prediction on the origin of these macro scale beta events. Okay, so now back to our question. Let's assume this is the mechanism that's creating these beta events. Can we use that to help us understand how beta is influencing the tactile evoked response, such that when you have more beta, you have a lower amplitude signal. And why, when that happens, does that correspond to, I didn't feel the tap to the finger? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna simulate this beta event together with a simulation of the evoked response, which I showed you previously, we can reproduce in our HNN model. And when we do that, what we find is indeed the HNN model does reproduce what we're seeing of the impact of beta on the evoked response. Now, importantly, I'd like to stop here in the talk to state that we actually did this in the model first. 
We had a prediction of where ERPs come from, S1 or ERPs. We then had a prediction about what the mechanisms of beta events are. We put these two predictions together, and this is what the model predicted we should see in our data. We then went and looked in our data, and lo and behold, that's what we saw. And so this was really exciting, and it's just a very nice example of when you include the right level of detail in the model, you can get all these new and generative predictions that emerge. Okay, so the model reproduces this effect, but what is going on in the underlying circuit? And how is it relating to the subject saying, I didn't feel the tap to the finger when we have a pre-stimulus beta event? Well, what the model is suggesting is the following. Recall that beta is created by this strong distal input, this distal drive that lasts 50 milliseconds. This input is not only hitting the pyramidal neuron dendrites, but it's also hitting the inhibitory neurons. And it's recruiting a lot of inhibition in the supergranule layers before you even tap the finger. So now when you tap the finger and you get this sequence of information flow to the local cortical circuit, and importantly, this feedback input comes in to generate this negative peak, that input can't get in because we have a lot of inhibition. And if that input can't get in, you get less activity in these pyramidal neurons. This late peak here is the activity of the pyramidal neurons. If you have less spiking these pyramidal neurons, you get a lower amplitude peak. These pyramidal neurons are the output neurons from the somatosensory cortex, from the primary somatosensory areas. And so if you get less spiking in the primary somatosensory cortex, you get less relay of information out of S1. The signal never gets to the rest of the brain and the subject says, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. And so again, beta, the model is predicting that beta is recruiting inhibition in the supergranule layers, such that when you tap the finger, you get less spiking in the pyramidal neuron populations, and then you get less relay of information out of the primary sensory area. And if it doesn't leave the primary sensory area, it doesn't get to higher order areas where subjects can report feeling the tap to the finger. Now, just to show you a little bit more detail of what's going on in the underlying model, what I'm showing you here is the simulated evoked response when we have a beta event in the model and when we don't have a beta event in the model. This is overlaid on the spiking activity from the different cell populations in the network. And so what you can see is that when we simulate a beta event, even before that first input arrives, you have a lot of inhibition in the supergranule layers. That inhibition is shutting down all the subsequent spiking activity. When we don't have a beta event and we don't have this pre-stimulus inhibition and we simulate the tap to the finger, we get all sorts of spiking in all of our pyramidal neuron populations and presumably a relay of information out of S1. Okay, so I've just shown you that HNN has led to these new predictions on where beta rhythms are coming from. We now have some validation of these predictions with invasive recordings and high resolution MEG laminar recordings. Um, the model is predicting that beta is decreasing tactile perception by recruiting inhibition in the supergranule layers. These are still model-based predictions um, that require further validation. And so lastly, I just wanna present some other examples that we've applied HNN to study. In addition to beta rhythms, we've also studied the mechanisms of generation of alpha rhythms and gamma rhythms in this somatosensory mu rhythm, the alpha beta complex, um, and we have several pri prior published studies. Our HNN tutorials that are available online are not only for beta, but also for alpha and gamma. For sensory perception, we've used HNN not to only study tactile evoked responses, but also most recently some auditory evoked responses HNN has been applied to look at the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on tactile evoked responses. We've looked at changes in ERPs and brain rhythms with aging. Other groups have used our model to study changes in somatosensory rhythms in children with autism. Um, and we now have a few published studies in which we're looking at combining HNN with human imaging and animal recordings. And so far, these have all been focused on our beta rhythm studies. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see a full list of publications on our website, um, and I also refer to our recent methods paper. Okay, so before I conclude, 
I just want to briefly mention how HNN compares to other neuromodeling software designed to infer the origin of EEG and MEG signals. There's several other modeling software out there. Here I'm just comparing to four of, I think, the most well-known softwares. Um, here's our human neocortical neurosolver. As you've seen, this is a GUI-driven software. We have this user-friendly graphical user interface that lets you interact with this large-scale detailed cortical model that's representing only a local area simulation, a patch of cortex in the brain. It's been specifically to, designed to infer the cell and circuit le level activity with workflows based on studying ERPs and low frequency rhythms in the alpha, beta, and gamma bands. That doesn't mean that this can't be used for other signals, but the tutorials and the design of our graphical user interface are based on our experience studying these signals. Two other softwares, the virtual brain and the statistical parametric mapping toolbox that has this DCM framework. Those are using these more reduced representations of neural activity, these neural mass models. And the goal there is to study inter-area activity. And so the virtual brain, they're doing whole brain simulations and they're being designed to integrate with DTI um, to get maps for personalized whole brain simulations based on individual DTI connectivity profiles. Um, and this is, again, a GUI-driven software. This um, SPM, it's, a, has, it's developed based in MATLAB. There are MATLAB scripts. And again, it's des designed to infer interactions among some predefined pre number of active nodes using the DCM um, inverse framework in neural mass models. There's also LFPi. Um, LFPi is distributed with Python scripts, and it's designed to simulate LFP, MEG, EEG, and ECOG from any multi-compartment neural model. And it's really designed for people that have experience using the neural modeling software Neuron um, and simulating LFP, MEG, and EEG from any neural model, where right now in our software, you're getting our predefined template model um, and we're actually using some of the LFPi framework in some of our model expansions. So again, these tools are all fantastic and they have unique features and which one you choose to use really depends on the question that you're trying to address. Okay, so to conclude, um, I've shown you that HNN simulates the primary currents underlying EEG and MEG signals with cell and circuit detail in a neocortical column model that's under thalamic cortical and cortical cortical influence. We provide workflows to develop and test hypotheses on the neural origin of sensory evoked responses in low frequency brain rhythms, focusing right now on alpha, beta, and gamma. HNN applied to our data has led to novel predictions on the circuit origin of these transient beta events. And it's suggesting that these pre-stimulus beta events are decreasing the salience of sensory information via the recruitment of supergranular in inhibition. And hopefully I've convinced you that HNN can be applied to uncover circuit mechanisms underlying EEG or MEG correlates of healthy behavior and neuropathological states within a user-friendly graphical user interface that's being designed to be accessible to the broad EEG and MEG community. And so before I end, I just want to thank my collaborators and funding sources. Um, I have an amazing lab at Brown University, and really everybody has contributed in a meaningful way to the results that I presented today. The HNN development team is a multi-institutional team from Brown, the Martino Center, at, Martino Center at MGH, the Neuron team at Yale University, and we now have some developers at the Nathan Klein Institute. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues at Brown and at the Nathan Klein who have generously provide data to begin to test some of the predictions that are coming out of our h and modeling framework. Um, and so with that, I thank you all again for your time and sticking through for this last talk of the day, and I'm happy to take any questions. This is this is incredible. Uh, I'm just wondering if we uh, see that beta is actually a 50 millisecond burst of inhibition. So why do we continue to call it beta rhythm? What's rhythmic about <laughs> a, a single event occurring? Yeah. So it's it, 
it, it's historical, right? We, when we put a frequency filter on it, we get high power in the beta band. And when you put frequency filters, we call them rhythms. Um, and it really wasn't until we started to try to study what are the mechanisms that create this rhythm that we realized it's not really this continuous rhythm. That's just an artifact of our averaging and our frequency filter. The field now um, is changing the language a little bit for beta. And again, it's not wrong to call it a beta rhythm because it is high power in the beta band at a certain frequency. Um, but more often now, we, in our lab, we call it an event. Um, the literature also now is referring to them as beta bursts. And I think we're all referring to the same phenomena, at least in many of the cases when we're looking at our macro scale signals. So it's now beta bursts, beta events, beta oscillations. Um, the key thing being that it's not this sinusoidal continuous rhythm. Although I shouldn't say that's always the case. You know, in disease states and in some experimental conditions, you can see beta that lasts for longer periods of time. You know, if you're looking in motor cortex and you have, um, you're holding something, you get this repeated beta activity in the motor area. So a lot of it does depend on your experimental condition. Okay. Um, thank you. Another question? Um, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I have a quick question regarding the uh, conclusion for uh, basically fitting this uh, model to the ERP for beta rhythms. Um, I was just wondering um, whether there is a basically a case that these could be driven by other parts of the cortex, not just the S1, because you seem, uh, I mean, the model seems to be just focusing on that um, spatially localized region and trying to find a set of parameters that are going to bas basically fit the ERP, but the brain is connected. So um, I wonder how much, for example, the volume conduction when you do source localization might actually affect to have effect from essentially other sources smeared into what you see as the ERP of the S1. I don't know if that makes sense, what I'm asking. Yes, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, and I think your question is really about our assumption that we have a localized signal when we're looking at these beta events. Um, because in our software, we assume that we're looking at activity from a patch of cortex, right? Because we're simulating it in a patch of cortex. This patch of cortex is obviously receiving information from other parts of the brain. Um, but you're right, we're, we're assuming it's a localized signal. Now, one of the ways we have confirmation that it's localized is we see something very similar in our LFP, right? Which is by definition, a more local signal. Um, we're also seeing something very similar in our layer resolved MEG. Um, so we do believe, we don't know what the spatial spread of these beta events is, but we can make estimates based on our model. So one thing I didn't emphasize in our modeling framework is that we typically only simulate 100 pyramidal neurons in the supergranule and infragranule layers. And so we have this 200 pyramidal neuron network. And then we assume that the activity recording is generated by a bigger network that's synchronously active. And so we apply a scaling factor. We just multiply the output of our simulation by a scaling factor. And that gives us an estimate of how many neurons might actually be contributing to this size signal that we've source localized. And so in our data, the amplitude of the beta event is roughly 100 to 400 nanoampere meters. The model is estimating that that's being generated by on the order of a million sub-threshold pyramidal neurons. So it's not that a million pyramidal neurons are firing at a beta frequency. It's that we have this sub-threshold current flow um, across a very large population of pyramidal neurons. Now, if we had used a different inverse solution technique and maybe got a smaller amplitude signal or maybe even a bigger amplitude signal, then our model would predict we either need a smaller scaling factor or a larger scaling factor to represent um, the, the actual amplitude of the source likewise signal that we saw. We don't actually have a definitive estimate of how spatially precise these beta events are, how much we can control them. We have seen that 
we do these attention experiments where we say, pay attention to your finger and pay attention or your, or your foot. And we do see that beta can be spatially manipulated with attention. And so it suggests there is some somatotopy that's adjustable, um, but the exact scale over which that occurs is an open question. It probably depends on your experimental paradigm. Yes, please. Hello. Um, thanks for the great talk. And also, thanks for this discussion on beta burst versus rhythmic beta. I think it will be a great turning point for lots of literature that is out there. Uh, but I wanted to ask, indeed, something similar again. Do you think that it actually um, this theta burst could be a little bit more task dependent? And so in this case, you are talking about perception of mm -hmm. uh, tactile stimuli. But what if we're actually using more rhythmic task or uh, motor task? For example, there is literature on speech production, motor preparation, mm -hmm. or the work from Peter Brown in Oxford with mm -hmm. Parkinson patients in basal ganglia, where the rhythm, where these beta rhythms seem to be a little bit different rather than packed into these bursts. So the first question would be, do you think it's context dependent? And the second question, it's more about the modeling part. Could uh, NHH also model cross-frequency coupling? So again, uh, in the beta literature, there is lots um, about how, for example, delta to beta would interact. And so on the role of uh, inhibition of probably beta to more devil rhythms or vice versa. So could cross-frequency coupling be modeled with NHH? Mm -hmm. uh, so to answer the first question about beta activity, and I think the question was, is it generalizable to other tasks and potentially other brain areas? You mentioned motor cortex. Um, and actually, uh, Peter Brown and his group have looked at the waveform shape of beta events in motor cortex in Parkinson's patients. And they do have some papers showing that it also has this, um, what we call an inverted Ricker wavelet shape. And that the sharpness is exaggerated in Parkinson's patients. And that may be why they have exaggerated beta power when they put a frequency filter on it. And when they do things with either pharmacology or DBS, it normalizes the sharpness of these beta events. We've also done MEG studies where we see beta source localized to motor cortex. It looks very similar. Um, and as I've said, you know, the commonality in the sh in, in frontal cortex, the shape also looks very similar in our data. And it suggests that there's really some canonical structure of the cortex that's dictating the mechanisms generating these beta events. Um, and so we do believe that motor cortex, frontal cortex, other primary areas have the right structure to generate beta um, based on the way that we've generated it in our model. Now, whether this will account for every beta and every experimental condition, probably not, um, and in disease states, but as a first pass for our perception experiments and for motor experiments, it does seem to be giving us clues as to what's going on in the underlying cortical network. Um, the other thing I should mention that I did in this talk, but what we find is that it's actually, when we, when we first looked at, oh, we have higher power on non-detected trials, right? If we look pre-stimulus, we see higher power. We first thought we were gonna get a higher amplitude oscillation or a bigger network contributing to our response. But when we looked at the underlying data, what we found was it was actually the rate of these beta events that mattered, such that the more events we had, the less likely we were to feel that tap to the finger. And the reason that we had high power is because we averaged more events, um, not because these events were changing in amplitude in any way, not because it seemed like we were getting a bigger network of activation. The amplitude didn't change, it was the number that changed. And so we believe that it's somehow this transient repeated recruitment of inhibition that is keeping a lot of inhibition around that we can't feel the tap to the finger. A similar thing could be happening in motor cortex. When we have Parkinson's patients that have this elevated beta activity in this difficulty initiating movement, it could be that we're getting more and more of this burst of input to motor cortex. It's recruiting inhibition. And then when the subject is trying to give the motor cortex a signal to move, 
that signal can't get in and, and so it's it's inhibiting movement. And so we do believe that the same principles can apply to other brain areas um, in, in tasks, but a lot of it is still open question and hopefully generating some new ideas on how ways to look at our data. Oh, and the other question was about the modeling. Can we look at cross frequency coupling? Um, absolutely. There isn't any reason you couldn't think about the origin of cross frequency coupling um, from a local cortical area. And we actually, in our data, see a little bit of coupling between beta and theta. We see that these beta events are occurring every 250 milliseconds. So that's creating this cross frequency coupling between the beta rhythm and the theta rhythm. And in our model, we can create that by just simulating this burst every 250 milliseconds. And that creates the beta theta coupling. The other coupling we've looked at is we have a paper looking at gamma oscillations and they're coupled, well, when I say gamma, I mean low gamma, um, 50 hertz oscillations. And they're coupling to higher frequency gamma oscillations around 100 hertz. Um, and what we see is that the mechanisms that generate these 50 hertz oscillations create this waveform shape that, again, when you put a frequency filter on it, it gives you 100 hertz power. And so you get this coupling between low and high gamma that comes out of the network, not because you have two different processes creating low and high gamma, but because the mechanism creates a waveform shape where you get gamma, low and high gamma um, in your frequency domain. I think that answered both questions. We will oh, move to the general discussion, so you will okay. be able to ask your questions, but other people will also be able to ask other questions to, to Marike, for example. And uh, before that, I would like you to thank again uh, Stephanie Jones for the talk. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Actually, this is a question for Stephanie Jones. Thank you for this very interesting talk. I find it very impressive how you can model both uh, evoke responses and frequency responses in a, in a localized patch of cortex. So my question is the following. It picks up on the penultimate question. This is, you, you model really local processes, right? But then if you look at the actual MEG or EEG, this is, patch of cortex creates an electrical field that is distributed across the entire scalp. So now my question is how precisely can you reconstruct the electrical field at the other sensors that you do not directly model? So have, you, or have you ever looked at that? So we're not modeling sensor level data. Um, we are modeling what, once you've already source localized your data, so you've already taken into account the mixing of signals and how they uh, contribute to different sensor level signals. And so we're relying on the assumption that you have a good, a good source localization technique and you really have isolated the contribution from a area, a patch of cortex within the brain. Now that said, we have used our software to study sensor level signals um, from EEG sensors above primary somatosensory cortex. And what we find is that the ERP in the sensor looks almost identical to the ERP at the source. I mean, at the end of the day, it's generated by the same circuit. The challenge in using source data, I'm sorry, sensor data and connecting that to HNN is we have to have an understanding of current up and down the pyramidal neuron dendrites or in and out of the cortex. 
And when we are in source space, we can get that information, right? Our inverse so solvers allow us to infer directionality of the current. When we're at the sensor level, we have to kind of do that um, by hand and say, okay, is this an inward or an outward current? Would it correspond to up or down the dendrites? But for some of these very common signals, we see that the waveform shapes do look similar either in source space or in sensor space. Also, our beta events, they look almost identical whether we look at them in the source or at a sensor above where we're recording. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, it's designed for once you've gotten past the problem of mixing from different brain areas and you've done the inverse solution and you think you have a good representation of the activity in a patch of cortex, that's when you go to HNN um, and are able to match the output with your source localized data. Okay, so you only looked at the local sensor, but you didn't look at all these sensors. That's right, that's okay. right. The reason now, why I'm asking also yeah. is like, I, I work on topographic EEG, to topographic approaches to EEG, uh -huh. and we try to simulate EEG microstates with the virtual brain. So uh -huh. the virtual brain produces really beautiful time courses of waves that have different, um, different frequency bands, you can simulate everything. But then if you compare this, the topography of the simulated data to, or if you look at the topography of the simulated data, it's just random. It's, yeah, garbage almost. There is no clear topography, even though what you see in the time domain looks like perfectly beautiful EEG, alpha waxing and waning, you name it. Could you comment on that? I think we're still far away from like a nat reproducing a natural EEG outside. So the there's there's two different um, questions here. One is how does the brain create the whole brain signal that we record with our EEG, right? Which is all of the sensor. Uh, the activity may happen over here, but you're recording it over here. That's the forward model through the brain. Then there's the inverse model of okay, now we're in a small part of the brain. The question that we're addressing is different. It's what is the micro circuit activity? What is the local um, laminar structure? How is that creating to that signal in that part of the brain? Now, there are methods to take what we're getting out of HNN, put it through a field map, a forward model of the brain and get at sensor level signal. And actually LFPi has tools that do this very nicely. Um, but unless you have simulation of the other parts of the brain like they do in the virtual brain they've got nodes all over the brain you know the forward solution from one part of the cortex may not be very meaningful right because you you haven't unmixed it with all the other parts of the brain and you do that unmixing when you apply your your source localization methods to get at the patch of cortex so i can't comment on um the virtual brain and why it loses spatial resolution, I don't really have enough understanding about the software to answer that question. But I do think we're asking different kinds of questions with the two different softwares. You know, they're really all about mapping onto whole brain activity. We're really all about understanding the details, the finite details of localized brain activity. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Meanwhile, I should say that the virtual brain is perfect. You know, it's developed in Marseille, so it has not, no problem, no issues. Yeah. Um, so maybe I have first a question also for you, um, Professor Jones. Um, can you try to explain to me when you see, like, for example, this uh, theta, beta nested uh, coupled oscillations? Mm -hmm. um, the underlying um, biology, do you observe, is it just like you have neurons that produce beta bursts and there's an emergent property that is at this period of silence and then mm -hmm. if you do a time frequency decomposition you observe delta or is it that you have um, neural networks that produce beta, some of those that produce delta and they are coupled? Could you see the difference? Yes, yes. Um, and so in our data we're looking at beta theta, right? We've got these beta events and on average they come in at every 250 milliseconds. 
And so we get these high power beta activities approximately every 250 milliseconds. Because of that, in your frequency filter, you also get a theta band, right? So now we have theta and we have beta. In our model, I've explained how we're simulating these beta events. We have these bursts of activity that come in and they hit the network. This one comes in and it lasts 50 milliseconds and it's stronger than this one. Um, we believe, we're, our hypothesis is, that both of these inputs are coming from the thalamus. There are these thalamic nuclei that fire bursts of activity, um, and when they, when they come in rhythmically, they can create these beta bursts over, you know, why it's at 250 milliseconds on average, I'm not sure. Um, but the idea would be that there's something going on in the thalamus that's causing it to create these high power events every 250 milliseconds. That would be the hypothesis that comes out of our model. It's not that the local circuit is doing something different um, where the beta comes from these bursts of input and the theta comes from some other circuit gener generator. That's not what it is. It's that the thalamus is somehow regulating the timing of these bursts that are coming into the cortex. Now, that's a hypothesis. It could be that this distal input is coming from another part of the brain, right? Maybe it's coming from motor cortex. Maybe it's coming from um, frontal cortex or frontal to thalamic to cortical area. In our model, we don't have that level of detail. And so we have to infer from literature and from other experimental recordings and techniques where these signals are coming from. Okay, thank you. I have two questions for you, curiosity. You talk at the end about the meditation. So did you use or are you planning to use some meditation study to infer something about mind wandering? Mainly not in expertise monks, but uh, mm -hmm. people that started to do meditation. Um, yeah, so, well, meditation and mindfulness are another research area of mind that I didn't talk about here. Um, uh, where we've actually also used computational models to better understand the cognitive mechanisms that are being changed by meditation. Um, and I definitely want to run the study where we take experienced meditators and um, give them the same kind of mind-wandering task and then see whether they get better. Because there's these claims that these people should get better at um, um, judging their mind wandering state. And then if that's the case, then I should predict, I would predict that there should be a more uh, unambiguous mapping between the EEG signals and the, um, uh, the self-report judgments. But I guess it uh, remains to be seen. And also about the biomarker that you want to use, also did you consider inverse solution to work on yeah, um, so actually in the second machine learning study that I mentioned by Christina Yin, um, we did um, source localize the, um, uh, the, the signal in, the, in different dipoles. So we just went for simple dipole modeling because we don't have that much experience on uh, EEG source modeling. And we, we were able to um, localize different sources and we found that, for example, there was only one source that was common between two of the classifiers and most of the um, the classifiers really latched onto different sources. So there actually the source modeling was also very useful because it allowed us to see um, how the different classifiers differed from each other. Um, because I am always a little bit hesitant with source modeling methods because I don't know so much about them. And then I think that when I use them, I'll probably just easily produce noise basically and then I think better not to use them and just go with whatever I know we can observe and not make inferences about the possible sources. Thanks. Is there some other questions? Maybe a question for Alex who is currently in the train. Um, well, otherwise, it's 6 p.m. and I, uh, I think we should um, close the session. So let's thank again uh, all the speakers. And we'll have a last word. For thank you. Thank you very much for the great uh, session.
And well, you may have noticed that uh, Adrien has gone and uh, our captain is waiting for us uh, on the boat. Uh, so please join us. Thank <laughs> you.